it's 10 o'clock and it's time to roll. So let's, let's kick it off here. Hello, my name is Jason Engerman and I'm here with Bob Russell out of NSF and he's a developmental psychologist uh, with a lot of background in organizing and projects and engaging students with the public uh, I STEM or health in, in uh, museum, community and media context. And so he's coming to us from NSF and let me actually backtrack. Uh, we're here with Designers for Learning, uh, promoting um, our organization, uh, a nonprofit organization that uh, engages in virtual service learning projects for adult basic education. And we wanted to bring together everyone here for uh, what we call Ed Impact Day, our very first annual Ed Impact Day 2016, to bring people together from across the educational sphere toward building understanding and networks um, to push education forward uh, for uh, social, for the social good. And so we're here with Robert Russell, again, I'm backtracking, um, from the NSF. And we're very happy to have you here um, from you. the NSF, the National Science Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'd like you to start off with uh, what it is that you do at the NSF and um, your passion there. Okay, well, uh, what I do is I'm a program officer. There are a number of program officers, and we are the people that manage the review process for the proposals that people like you submit, you know, to fund your educational projects. So we recruit reviewers. We put together external review panels that critique the grants by writing a written review, and then in most cases, we also have a either an online or an in-person meeting where we discuss each proposal for 15 minutes to half an hour. And then program officers use that information and collaborate with, uh, we collaborate with our fellow program officers and based on how much money we have and what the, and what are the, seem to be the most important issues, uh, as well as the merits of the specific proposals, you know, we, we play a role in selecting which ones ultimately get funded. And what, you know, one part of it is there's usually enough, not much, not enough funding to fund all the projects we'd like to fund. So we have to make some tough choices. You know, there may be a couple of projects that are well designed and have very good reviews, but you know, if there's not enough money, we have to somehow select which ones we would recommend for funding. So we do that through kind of a group consultation of the program officers that are focusing on that, on whatever the program is. So that's what I do. So I spend a lot of time on the phone talking to people. I go to a lot of conferences just to tell people what NSF is all about and what funding opportunities are available. And then also a significant amount of time uh, reviewing or, you know, analyzing the specific proposals. We have to do, you know, it's a bureaucracy, so we have to write up a, an extensive recommendation whether the, pro the project will be funded or not. So writing takes quite a bit of time. And uh, anyway, there are, we have to work with outside organizations, other federal agencies, et cetera. So, so it's a fun job, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a little frustrated because I like to do projects and most of my work has been involved in running nonprofits and, and uh, developing projects. And so that's more of a hands-on thing. And by running projects, well, I, I have been director of a number of projects, but uh, you know, that, that usually involves, you know, going to a festival and setting up tents and tables or going to a school. So I usually get in, I've been involved both, you know, in figuring out what the projects are and hiring the staff and kind of managing the process. I usually hire people who really know what they're doing. So then I don't have to do that work <laughs> because they know how to do it. And uh, so <clears throat> my academic lemma, an example of, of an academic or a person who was on an academic track, I, I applied for academic jobs and there were really just not many jobs around at the time. I taught part-time at several universities, but I uh, had a really boring research job at an organization in Washington, DC. So I applied for a job uh, that became open. I just was applying for different kinds of jobs that had to do with children and education. And so I applied for a job as director of a children's museum. Um, and uh, so, and I never run a nonprofit, but I, I was offered the job and I took it. So I was, that's, that got me on an entirely different track of education outside the classroom as my major focus. So I was director there for several years and then I moved on to a science museum. I was director there for several years and then I did my first stint after that as a program officer at the National Science Foundation. And then after I was there for several years, I went back in the field, so to speak, and uh, developed, you know, for over 20 years, I directed, directed some uh, nonprofit media organizations and 
and also consulted with a variety of organizations on pretty much all varieties of informal science projects. And then a couple of years ago, I thought, well, it'd be interesting to go back to NSF again. So I applied and was uh, offered and accepted a position there. So I've been there, I guess, for a little more than three years in my most recent incarnation. And I work, uh, there are a range of programs from, uh, you know, age levels, pre-K to, I guess, when you're not here anymore, and uh, inside the classroom and outside the classroom, and that can be online, you know, in-person combinations, all variety of things. So some of the m more interesting kind of movements I've been involved with uh, among many have been the maker movement and the citizen science movement, because, um, you know, those, both of those movements are rapidly expanding, and so there are many organizations, and they have many new ideas and um, and that's what NSF likes to fund. So maybe just a little bit about what kinds of pro what kinds of educational projects NSF likes to fund in general, and uh, then maybe we can get into some questions. Um, NSF, I guess you might say NSF funds projects that develop new knowledge about about STEM education. And and maybe that could be described simply, this is very simplified, but in, you know, two different kinds of knowledge. One is, you might call it practice. Uh, what are some new and interesting and effective ways to engage people in STEM learning? Uh, whether that's in the classroom, online, you know, museum, or in any other way you can think of. Um, so that would involve coming up with a new method, experience, resource, curriculum, media, game, whatever it is. And, you know, to come up with a concept for that that had some basis in reality, some people had done some similar things, or there's some reason to believe that this concept could, could be effective. So, and again, this is simplified, but one kind of project you can imagine would be to take this take this uh, idea through a research and development process, you know, to find out both to improve it by doing several iterations of of whatever it is and and making some changes to make it work even better and then also to research to find out what's going on you know is is it effective and how are people learning from it? what factors are contributing to that so that's one kind of project and another kind of project is more like fundamental research there might be some learning environment whether it's a career development program or a an IMAX film or what have you after school program and you want to find out, you know, what's going on in that environment. And then there can be, a, and the research techniques can range from, you know, qualitative to so-called mixed methods, you know, quantitative and qualitative together to quantitative, you know, a randomized controlled trial, very carefully controlled circumstances. And the idea is to have a good research and theoretical background, you know, to guide the research questions that are being asked. And then, and, and then from that would also come the, the appropriate research methodologies. So then you would implement your your research and and try to understand what's going on. Uh, so that's the other type of project. So there are a whole crazy cool collection of programs that fund all varieties of these sorts of things. And I, I should add that I'm happy to uh, share uh, some recorded webinars and PowerPoint shows that you know that can walk you through all these programs because you know in uh, half an hour we'll. You know, that's, there's not enough time in a half an hour to do all that, but uh, that's right. a, sort of a general flavor of what NSF does in, with regard to education. Absolutely. We'd, we'd love to see those um, and have those, and we'll make those available to everyone uh, via the website, most likely. Um, so let's unpack a little bit of what you said. There's a lot there, right? We get a broad brush, and we get a big yeah. idea of what NSF does, but let's talk a little bit about this STEM movement and maker movement. I, some of us, we come from all different walks of life, mm -hmm. uh, I think, in this um, webinar, so we're not sure where we are. What what is the relationship between the maker movement and STEM, and what do you see as what what do you see STEM's future being in the classroom K to twelve? Well, uh, NSF's move. I should say NSF doesn't doesn't. Uh, give out real specific directions of what kind of projects it's looking for. You know, some funding agencies, and for, for probably good reasons for the mission of those agencies, they say we want this kind of program that has X, Y, and Z, you know, that does X, Y, and Z. Uh, at NSF, it's just send us your great ideas, you know, for out of school science education, whatever those might be. And, uh, you know, you can build on something that's been created in the past, or you can come up with something completely new. So there's no at least in theory, there's no prejudice for 
for or against any idea. You know, the, the main thing is, you know, is the idea well-founded in what we know? And does the idea show promise of being innovative and effective, you know, to contribute something new to how we do science education? So I don't know if I lost the train of thought of the, oh, the maker movement. Well then, so the maker movement, you know, the background of the maker movement, well, of course, we've always had inventors. Uh, we've had, you know, we've had, and we'll take it, indigenous people, they're just makers by nature, nature because they don't have a store where they can go buy electronics or, or bows and arrows or seeds or anything. They have to figure it out themselves. And the same for farmers. Farmers are far from a store, maybe, and they need to fix something. So they've been makers. And then in France, there's been a, there's the word bricolage, which refers to kind of tinkering and putting something together on the spot based on what you've got to work with. And uh, so we've always had people like that. And, uh, and then, you know, there have always been people that, like the people that, you know, do shortwave radio or uh, crystal radios and uh, people that do remote controlled airplanes and all kinds of hobbyists. Those, they've, hobbyists have been around forever. Uh, so with, with the advent of technology, CAD CAM design, uh, electronics, 3D printers, etc., cetera, uh, that's kind of ramped the whole thing up. Um, you know, maybe one of the one of the precursor movements to the maker movement is, you know, the Radio Shack stores used to be kind of the go-to place for makers that were doing electronics. So for people that wanted to build their own computers uh, or do things like that, well, they could go to uh, Radio Shack and, you know, get the, the parts they need to put together something. Uh, so it, it, it's kind of a combination of these, you know, various elements of, of people, hobbyists and people that are trying to create their own their own gizmos and, you know, technology, you know, and, um, and at the same time, uh, the make magazine and maker fairs, you know, were developed. So the, the movement was kind of branded and that kind of gave it an identity. And I think that helped just, it was already an underway, but that just kind of helped uh, ramp the whole movement up. And, and there are different incarnations of the maker movement. You know, there are the, tinkering spaces and science museums. There are maker spaces primarily for youth, like, you know, the, probably the best one in the Washington DC area is Digital Harbor in Baltimore, which is in a kind of a working class neighborhood and it serves kids from all over Baltimore, you know, at all age levels. And the kids come up with really amazing things. And they have workshops on how to, how to learn how to use, or how to, what you can do with a Raspberry Pi, for example. Um, and then, and then the kids can go and create a project based on the skills they've developed. Um, then there's the entrepreneurial maker spaces. So, how do, so maybe I could explain how that connects to NSF. So there are hundreds of maker spaces or organizations across the country, and NSF doesn't have money to just give everybody fifty thousand dollars or something like that. Uh, so we we get proposals for uh, for new approaches to how to how to support a maker space and create, you know, and provide a wider range of experiences or how to engage, uh, how to engage underrepresented, underserved communities, how to support those communities in developing maker spaces for their communities. And, and that's always been a, a, an important priority for NSF. That is bringing, you know, the great diversity of our country into STEM, you know, both just for the sheer enjoyment of learning science, but also uh, that's, you know, that's the core of our economy. So if our economy is going to keep going strong. Well, <laughs> by the time I kick the bucket, well, half of the people in our country will, you know, will be the so-called minorities. So uh, we better get going on that or else we're not going to be doing that well in 20 or 30 years. Um, so, um, so make some individual maker spaces and some make, there are some maker organizations like maker ed, and there's a number of them, uh, that, uh, that provide support for broad segments of the maker community. So they come up with ideas for ways of supporting the community, new way, new approaches to making and so on and, and research on what happens in making. Uh, so we, we're getting a variety of proposals, you know, for all facets of, of supporting the maker movement. And that's just typical if you, you know, take any area of STEM learning. Well, that's the nature of what NSF gets is just a rich variety of proposals addressing, you know, or trying to come up with uh, creative and innovative ways of, you know, improving how we, how we do science education. Um, and uh, there in fact is an opportunity to apply for maker for small 
we call them eager grants. They're small, kind of high risk, high, I mean, small for by NSF standards. I mean, $300,000 is a lot of money for me, but for NSF, that's, that's a smaller grant. So there's an opportunity uh, to uh, submit a proposal to support a kind of a high risk, high gain, early stage project uh, to, to that opportunity. And uh, I can make sure that there's information. I'll, I'll send out a PowerPoint to, um, to folks or you know to the organizers of the meeting and then they can make it available to to whatever list of people you have there excellent yeah i think that is a really nice segue into this concept of equity um and it's that concept of access so I, i'd love to talk about that a little bit um back in um it was august aera uh, met in this in Washington DC mm-hmm. and the entire the entire conference you know 25,000 uh, academics descended on uh, Washington DC among other professionals uh, for AERA which is the um, American Educational Research Association right. and it, it had a big huge con- uh, conference centered around equity and access and this is becoming a common theme uh, digital media and learning has also talked about equity and access. Games, uh, games, learning, and society is also talking about equity and access. We talk about defining and designing a well-articulated argument for using an innovative um, tool or task or, or creation or innovation for NSF. How is NSF reaching into these areas that may not have access to the intellectual capital that other places may have? Um, to, to, to engage in that space for, the, for, for diversity, to make the case for diversity to occur in these spaces that need it the most, whether they be urban environments, whether they be rural environments, um, you know, the Sunset Belt, for example, you look at the, the urban environments on the coast. Uh, so these are particular areas that are of, of particular unique nuanced needs. So how is NSF kind of approaching that issue um, around funding and, and access? Yeah, well, let me just say a, a quick thing before I, directly answer that question you know this is just my own take i mean of course anything i say today is just my own take on things not nsf position but anyway you know if you look at education educational equity and you look at you know how much money is available for schools in let's say urban schools versus suburban schools how much you know how how many the level of resources devoted to individual students who who live in um, you know in the segregated neighborhoods like here in Washington D.C. where I live and I live in a nearly all white neighborhood and then there are you know nearly all black neighborhoods and the schools in the minority you know uh, the population is minority African American here but in any event the uh, the predominantly African American schools are often you know much less well resourced than the schools in my neighborhood. And that's just the reality across the country. So you start with that inequity, and then you add to it the access to informal or outside the classroom resources. You know, so that's part of the problem. I think that's the fundamental problem in education is the lack of access to quality education. And that would explain a lot of the so-called gap between, um, you know, when students from minority backgrounds are compared with majority students. So, okay, so that's just my, I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, so NSF, you know, given the amount of funding it has, well, it, you know, it can't provide, you know, money that really significantly addresses the gap in resources. So what it can do is try to support projects that develop effective methods for recognizing the educational interest, community interest, and needs of, of various populations. So so that so NSF you know could be like everybody could be doing a lot better and we need to do a lot better but uh, in in some of the grant solicitations there is we call it special review criteria but we ask applicants to say so how is your project going to uh, recruit and address the educational interests and needs of of the students community and so forth. So, you know, so for a grant to get highly ranked, well, they have, they not only have to have an interesting and creative idea for, let's say it could be a game, it could be whatever the focus of the project is. And then the, the applicant, they also have to discuss what is their strategy for m- making sure that they can recruit, you know, it's gonna, the focus of the project may in fact be on, you know, on let's say Native Americans. Well, then, they, you know, in that case, the, project would have to discuss how are they going to recruit students so students would have access to whatever the program is and how would they how would they design the program so that it would be of interest and continue to engage those students and uh, and then how will is a program designed to meet the specific 
needs of those students. So that's one way is just trying to encourage, or not to encourage, but to require project designers to directly address that issue. Uh, the second is we try to recruit program officers. You know, I, I'm not representative of, I mean, you know, I'm part of the ma majority, so to speak, but, but NSF is very open to pro uh, applicants to program officer positions, you know, who come from a variety of backgrounds, because as we know, diversity enriches the science research process and it enriches the discussion. And it's not just, you know, it's not just the perspective of that we need perspectives from the African American community, Native American community, et cetera, uh, which we clearly do. But if you have a diversity of perspectives, cultural, language, uh, scientific expertise around the table, it makes for a much, much richer analysis of the grant proposals that we have. So um, that's another way. So we try to recruit reviewers from all backgrounds and we try to make sure that every background has a diversity of scientific educational expertise as well as an ethnic cultural expert or background. So uh, any of you that are interested in being a reviewer, I think my, my uh, email and address are earlier in the chat log there. So I'm, uh, you know, we welcome, uh, Welcome, you know, sending, you can send me emails indicating your, your interest in being a reviewer and then just include a one or two page bio sketch. And, and likewise for applying for positions, NSF is kind of interesting in that uh, about half of the program officer positions are uh, temporary. So, you know, someone may get a, an appointment for one to three or four years. And, you know, a, a common case is someone who comes from a nonprofit or a university and they, they are on leave from their organization for a couple of years and they come to work at NSF and then they return to their organization. And so the idea is to keep fresh ideas coming into NSF so that, the, you know, the staff at NSF hasn't been there for 40 years. It's good to have some continuity, but it's also good to have fresh ideas coming in. So we encourage people from all backgrounds to apply for those positions as well as the permanent positions. Um, so those are some of the ways, and then ultimately NSF does end up supporting a significant number of projects that are designed to um, address the, the educational interests and needs of Latinos, Native Americans, persons with disabilities, African Americans, etc. Rural areas, for example, too. So, uh, so those can be an interesting, uh, an interesting aspect of a project to design, a, you know, an experience, but also to uh, tailor that experience so that it's very relevant for the population that it might be targeted for a project. Right. So can you just talk just very briefly about about the um, about reviewing again? Um, I think that one of the questions was, uh, do you have to be in person to review? How does that really work again? Well, look, reviewer, okay, how, getting... we do both online, you know, online discussions like the, you know, like a platform like what we're using right here could be used for, you know, an online review panel so that, you know, we'd have anywhere from probably four or five to maybe eight or nine people and, and, you know, and it would just be an online discussion. And then likewise, we have in-person discussions. So the nature of those discussions is the same. It's just that, you know, in some cases people are in person and in some cases it's online. So, okay. you know, if a person doesn't have the ability, and, and if you are a reviewer and you and it's an in-person panel, you, you know, your travel expenses are covered, et cetera. But if you don't have the ability to travel for various reasons, you, you know, you have children to take care of or whatever the case might be, then that's when we put, try to put you on an online panel if, you know, if we really wanted to have you as a reviewer. Um, so you can have an international, you can have an international reviewer then. So you, have, uh, you take yeah. on an international reviewer? Yes. Yeah, okay. the, the only, yeah, that's true. And so you get a very modest uh, honorarium, I guess you'd say, for serving as a reviewer. And I think that I think that foreign reviewers aren't eligible to receive that honorarium. I'm not sure why, but so you can be a, you can be a reviewer from another country, but you may if you don't. And if you did it, happen to attend in person, well, then your travel expenses would be paid for. But you wouldn't receive the, you know, several hundred dollars honorarium that uh, U.S. citizens would receive. Or, you know, or people that live in, I don't think you, you don't have to be a U.S. citizen, but you have to be a, uh, a permanent resident, so to speak. To, to, you know, not to, not to be a reviewer, but to receive the honorarium. So that's the only catch there. Excellent. So there, there's this one question that we've been asking everyone mm -hmm. um, before I open it up. I've got lots of questions here that mm -hmm. people are pouring in uh, for you about your, your work. 
But this question is, what impact do you think um, you'll make uh, within this education sphere? What's your vision for the impact that you want to make broadly in the larger education sphere? Well, just to try to be concrete about it. So the maker movement, I think, is very exciting. And, it, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a strong advocate of education outside the classroom because that's where people, you know, people have a strong interest and they have a passion for developing something. Well, you know, you can go your own way outside the classroom and maker spaces are ideal places for for youth to discover their interests and to, you know, uh, to use their creativity. And it's a great place for ad adults that are create similarly creative but may have a product that they want to develop and manufacture. Uh, so, so the impact I can have on the maker movement, I mean, I, you know, I don't say that I can shape the maker movement, but I, I can both identify needs that it seems like the maker movement has and encourage people to submit proposals. And then I can also work with applicants who may have an idea that I would have never thought of, but I can help them structure it so that their proposal might be more effective, you know, within the competition. Uh, so those are the ways in which a program officer can can influence a, a field. And another way is that NSF supports smaller workshops, bringing together, you know, maybe 10 or 20 people or larger conferences to address some broad issue that is relevant to, you know, a large segment of the STEM education community. So if let's say there's an up for just to give you an example of an upcoming conference, there's an upcoming conference in several months in at the Exploratorium. And it's going to explore the topic of how to engage Latinos more effectively in learning science outside the classroom. So just a whole variety of practitioners from science museums and community organizations, organizations like National Council of La Raza and so forth are coming to that conference, you know, and as well as some researchers and project developers. So in that mix of people, we'll, that conference will address, will try to address those issues and come up with some new strategies and, and new project ideas to more effectively engage Latinos in learning science outside the classroom. So if you have a, an, if you have identified a need that you think is important, let's say, I guess the organization sponsoring this, you're focused to a degree on adult learning outside the classroom. So let's say, you wanted to, you know, you wanted to use uh, science education in uh, GED classes. I mean, that might be an interesting idea for a project if you could come up with a, cre if a creative idea of doing that and maybe even online. I don't know. But uh, that's an example of, uh, you know, of how NSF can have an impact on, on uh, you know, on a, some general area of activity. Excellent. So that segues us nicely into the ideas of access and you talked about rural um, environments. So from Lisi Wise, we have this question. Uh, as you know, adult education programs, especially those in remote rural areas, barely have enough to stay open. So right. your research proposals usually require a lot of research, which programs are not equipped to necessarily handle. So do you have right. funding for rural programs to offer STEM training without the burden of providing such detailed research with control groups, et cetera, experimental groups, and even in particular with mathematics. I think Susan Jones mm -hmm. is really interested. In that well, I'd that. say kind of no, but let me put it this way. Um, if you have, if there's an organization and it wants to develop a, a new, I mean, let's say that you, you know, you found that you have an idea for a very cost of effective way of doing um, math education with adult learners. Uh, maybe it would be online. So what NSF could do is it could provide an organization with funding to develop that idea and to take it through a, an R&D process. And, the R and, and so in that case, you may want to, you know, the organization might want to have a partnership with a university where there are people that that's what they do. And so that's a typical partnership is uh, where an educational researcher or learning scientist or group works directly with an organization that's developing a project idea and both in developing the idea and then in taking it through a process to improve it and make sure that it's maximally effective. So the money, so the funding would, could support the development of the idea, the implementation of it, uh, and the research of that idea. So, you know, the initial phase could be supported by NSF and then as is the case with most foundations. And, you know, I know, I mean, I, I've been on the other side, so I know how this works that you get funding from somebody and then, and then, you know, then you're on your own as far as how to make it last over the, over, you know, time. But that's how it, that's how it, it can work at NSF. So you can get, you know, you know, in effect, you can get some initial funding to support the operation of the program, and that is to, and that is 
provide an opportunity for researchers to see, you know, to see what's going on. So. Yeah. And okay. that's, so no, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. You're go ahead. Oh, I was just, I mean, that's, just, and that's, and, and, you know, it seems that, you know, just from my experience, well, a majority of, of federal, well, there are some federal agencies that do support, oh, like the gear up program is a depart is a program out of the department of education that it doesn't relate to adult education. I mean, what it does, what it does address is supporting students whose families don't have a, past history of going of getting college degrees and it, it provides services to school systems and to students you know to uh, you know make sure they get a good education and, and you know additional tutoring or whatever is needed to uh, support their transition into higher ed uh, so that's operational so the department of education uh, you, and you'd want to talk to somebody from the department of education about what adult ed uh, resources might be available for example uh, so there might be resources available in Department of Ed and perhaps in some other federal agencies for, you know, ongoing support of, of educational programs for adults. All right. Okay. So it's kind of shifting gears just a little bit. What, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's another question here about the NSF listing health occupations like nursing among the STEM fields. Uh, mm -hmm. So, what what how does the STEM definition through the NSF impact and affect a wider range of occupations outside of our traditional ideologies of education, engineering, and math and science? Why why would a why would a field like nursing be among the STEM fields? As NSF well, I mean, has? On, on the one hand, you know, in order to become a you know a doctor or a nurse, well, you have to take a fair amount of science and math. Uh, so, and to that extent, NSF might support uh, classes or educational experiences that's, that support education that's important for, on, you know, as part of the academic pathway to pursue it, a health profession. And just to point out also that NSF supports um, community colleges and other, you know, NSF isn't only for supporting PhD programs. It's like I said, it supports informal education. So that's, you know, very casual or in some cases casual, you know, education, brief educational experiences, but it does support community colleges and technical professions and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, the NIH is the federal agency that carries the burden of, of provide of training health professionals and you know conducting biomedical research that uh, is that has the mission of addressing diseases and human health. NSF supports uh, NSF does support some research on human biology, and a lot of the educational programs are on biology and you know which contributes in a general way to uh, you know to health education. So, you know, there's not a real strict dividing line, but generally NSF supports pretty much all of the research that the federal government supports. Uh, that's, you know, it's not defense research, but I mean, just basic research on all the disciplines uh, with the exception of the kind of research that NIH supports. And that, and that also carries over to the types of professions, that, the pro types of professions that NSF would support. All right. Great. So one, one last question before we segue off. Um, uh, there's just one more here. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we, how do we find the best NSF programs for our proposal? So maybe we have this great idea, but we're not exactly sure where it fits. So how do we make an align with the, the right, uh, you know, slot and within the NSF, the larger umbrella of NSF? Well, I guess to give you a quick answer, uh, you know, two ways. One is I will, I will uh, share a PowerPoint presentation that walks through uh, a lot of the educational programs. So you can, I mean, all the information is available online, but it's quite a chore to wade through all that material. So maybe this will provide an introduction and provide some help. Now, second is to talk to a program officer. And there are a lot of program officers. So you can have your idea and maybe briefly describe it to to me or to one of the other program officers and then uh, you know if we are helpful to you in identifying a specific program that seems like a good fit then we encourage you to write up a one or two page summary of your idea and then have another conversation where we'd give you more targeted feedback you know because you would have structured your idea around a specific program like the advancing informal stem learning 
or ITEST, which is a career-focused program. So if you called in and you had an idea for a career development program for K through 12 students, well, then we'd say, well, that program is probably the one you want to look at. And, you know, you know and, and we could discuss your idea and then encourage you to write up a, write up a summary that focuses on that specific program opportunity. Excellent. Wow. Well, thank you. We want to thank you, uh, Bob, for hanging out with us and, and really uh, pouring all that information to us from the NSF. And you've got some great resources that we're going to share on later on our website. So you're not going to want to miss that. We're going to push, push those out as you give those to us. Um, I think there's, there's a lot to chew on. You know, we have a contact now, which is great in the NSF to allow us to have open conversations about our ideas and how to push them forward out into the larger education sphere for people. So that's great to hear your message. And we really appreciate you having it, uh, you taking the time to spend with us. Okay, great. Well, I'll try to follow up really next week with some of the resources. And, uh, and then, you know, you, you, can, you can contact us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right. Have a good Saturday. You too. Right. <laughs> Thanks Enjoy for joining us. Have a good Saturday.